Okay, so um, I'm a full-time employee of Cochrane. I've got no other competing interests, as far as I know. Going to just try and cover these next four, these four areas on this slide. Uh, it's a short introduction. Think about some challenges that we face as an evidence producer and maybe how we're addressing them, and, uh, and I'll sum up. So I um, was uh, rabbiting around uh, looking for an, uh, an article online a few week, days ago, and I came across an article in The Lancet, and I saw for the first time that Lancet had a manifesto. I apologize to them if they've had it for years and I haven't noticed, uh, but it was just the other day that I did. And I, I read it and I just thought, this is rather good, uh, really. Not for the first time in my life, I thought, I wish I'd written that, but I hadn't. So improving lives is the only end goal that matters. It's got sort of passion to it, hasn't it? And research is only relevant when it has impact on human lives. Well, I think as, as manifesto as it go, that's pretty damn good, certainly better than anything we're being offered in the UK today. And on the, uh, the same sort of period, I was uh, reading this blog by Tessa Richards, uh, who's a BMJ um, editor. And it talked about her, um, her, her, her experience of healthcare as a consumer. And uh, there were sort of two things that really came about part of this. Was one, there's a the revelation which was new to me that multidisciplinary care might in some way put a, a sort of barrier between the patient and, uh, and the health professional. And that seems sort of interesting. I hadn't really thought of that, but it makes sense when you, you see it. Uh, and the second thing, and actually, to some extent, uh, uh, Catherine's just uh, given some further examples of this, is that you know, some uh, conversations between healthcare professionals and, uh, and patients seem to me to uh, be of a sort that I would have raised an eyebrow about when I was a medical student, and yet they're still happening. And that's, well, let me tell you, that's a long time ago. So, um, you know, Tessa said in her, her, her blog, we need better conversations between patients and health professionals. I'm sure that's true. When I was still a GP in 1999, I went to a talk at the Royal College of GPs uh, given by this chap, Professor uh, Per Fugeli, who's a professor of social medicine in Oslo. And he was talking, that's a bit annoying, he was talking about uh, the building blocks of trust in general practice, I think it was general practice, but it might have been medicine, uh, between medicine and health professionals, between patients and health professionals. And he came up with the, these five building blocks. And we could take, spend quite a long time talking about them all, but these two uh, made an uh, enormous resonance with me at the time. And maybe, to some extent, uh, along with Fee, contributed to me being in this place now uh, at this time. It seems to me that what I do ought to be absolutely at the heart of trying uh, a search for realism in healthcare, uh, combined with an idea of shared care leading to shared decision making. So it seems to me now that we're in a time when evidence is changing. And I think having been to a number of uh, presentations at this conference so far, it's quite clear to me that, that, that we are seeing a change of emphasis around evidence. Um, for many years now, we've been increasingly aware of the limitations of traditional forms of evidence. So the ever-expanding uh, list of causes of bias, uh, the problems around manufacturer sponsorship and, conflict and conflicts of interest, uh, the limitations of journal reports, uh, the problems of fraud. Um, if you're a Cochrane person, uh, you, you'll, you'll be aware of con cu current discussions around the problems of uh, meta-analyses of small trials, for example. Um, you'll be aware that um, you know, evidence is not just about randomized controlled trials. And you know, probably a decade since Doug Altman first pointed it out, uh, we're still seeing uh, studies and reports where people give a, a too much emphasis to this issue of statistical significance. So evidence is changing. And the needs of the sort of end users of evidence are also changing. So um, people are asking different sorts of questions. It's not just about, is a drug better than another drug for a certain condition? Uh, people are asking questions about risk and prognosis and diagnosis and all sorts of things, and asking complex questions about health systems interventions and so on. 
and we're looking at different sources of evidence, not simply random, published reports of randomized trials, but uh, clinical study reports, regulatory data, uh, non-randomized studies, big data, uh, bits and pieces on your iPhone, and so on. So different sources of evidence, different types of questions, increasingly complex re uh, systematic reviews. And at the same time, the people that are wanting to use those uh, pieces of evidence want them all delivered much more quickly. So it's quite a challenging time. And finally, I think there are some, I'm really glad I put new in inverted commas, that now that having seen Paul Glasier at lunchtime, I realised that overdiagnosis is about 20 or 30 years old. Um, I had it down at about five. Um, and actually, I'm old enough to remember Ivan Illich, so there you are. Um, but, you know, there are a number of problems around evidence uh, that I think we're really only scratching the surface of at the moment. That, so, for example, comorbidity, ageing populations, uh, overdiagnosis, as I say, which I think, as uh, Paul said, and as Gilbert Welch says, is probably one of the biggest challenges that we face. Um, I was at a meeting earlier this week where we talked again about the poor reporting of interventions, such that they're not, it's not possible to reproduce them in practice. Uh, as a major contribution and completely avoidable comp uh, a contribution to research waste. And um, part of my life is now spent reading emails on uh, the, the uh, listserv that Margaret uh, set up around overdiagnosis. And one of the issues that comes up there amongst the health professionals and so on that, that inhabit that listserv is around concerns that evidence is coercive or it's a bit authoritarian. And I think this is a really big issue. And you can go back and look at p papers from 1992 where people say, actually, evidence isn't sufficient to make decisions. You need other factors, clinical factors, patient factors, and so on. And so it was always there. But it's, nonetheless, it's still 20-odd years on perceived as being authoritarian. And actually, what was really interesting, I thought about Victor Montori's talk last yesterday, was about this idea of a slightly more uh, softer focus to it all. So in summary, the evidence is always insufficient because it's never in itself enough to make a decision, but it's also often insufficient because there isn't enough evidence or it's flawed or it's uh, irrelevant to the question that you're asking. Uh, it may be inaccessible. It may be inaccessible because you can't access it or it may be inaccessible because you can't understand it uh, or it may, it may not be actionable. It may not be the sort of evidence that you can simply put uh, into your own life. So um, as you say, we, we, we are most concerned about our own lives, but can you use the evidence and put yourselves in that context. But out in the world, people still want to make decisions. And about, I don't know, three years ago, I was sitting in my then office at the King's Fund, and I was slightly cross with myself because I hadn't bought access to go to a conference that was going on downstairs about telemedicine. And I decided to watch it on Twitter. Why on earth? Anyway, um, so... Uh, Anyway, the, the issue of evidence came up and said, you know, what does, somebody's tweeted, what does the evidence say? And the next tweet came in about seven milliseconds. Someone's saying, we just can't wait for the evidence. Let's just get on with it. And I think that response happens a lot, um, you know, particularly around intervention that people sort of assume must be a good thing, sort of axiomatically that people are thinking it must be a good thing. I've had a lot of uh, contact with hospitals in the last year, and it's almost impossible to go to a hospital in the UK, I think, without being bombarded with uh, an invitations to contribute for them to get an, ambulance, uh, an air ambulance. So God knows how many air ambulances there are currently in London, for example, where actually there are quite a lot of hospitals as well. And yet uh, there is a Cochrane review on the amb air ambulance, and it shows a considerable amount of uncertainty. And it turns out, when you look at the evidence on telemedicine, there's an awful, awful lot of uncertainty too. And so, in a sense, this, we've got this problem of evidence, in a sense, not quite being there when people need it in the form that people need, want it, and then they're making mistakes, and at the very least, using resources inappropriately and very likely uh, causing harm in many cases. So I'm going to talk a bit about uh, how we address the problems the, of producing the right evidence in the first instance. So we have our strategy. I'm not going to blab on about the strategy. Don't want to be accused of being corporate. Um, Hilda. Um, but um, there, what I wanted to show here were the first two goals, which are about this real balance between producing evidence and having that evidence used in practice. And those seem to me it's important to have that balance. 
And so we're thinking about a number of aspects of how we make better evidence. So moving towards much more active prioritization. I would like every Cochrane review, to, uh, the reader to be able to tell why somebody thought, well, what, what, what the authors thought the evidence was for why that was a priority. We clearly need to be managing quality because the quality is moving and we have standards around that. Uh, we have a major problem. I don't think you can go to an evidence live conference in any year since they began and not be told how, uh, how what a great challenge it is for Cochrane to produce its evidence on, in a timely way. And we have the whole issue about how we adopt new methods to address the new questions people are asking. And you know, again, this is a challenging thing for us to do. I'm sure it's challenging for everyone. But when we look back at how we've done over the last 10 years, there have been some things that we could have done quicker and better. We're doing some things OK. This is a, a, a repeat, a, a study published very recently of a 2008 study. By, uh, this one is by Matthew Page and David Mower, showing that across a number of standards for reporting, Cochrane reviews are still outperforming non-Cochrane reviews, even though the non-Cochrane reviews have got a lot better. So this is good news, but we still face a lot of challenges. I want to talk a bit about usage now and increasing use and increasing uh, uh, interest and involvement in evidence. And I just want to show this slide, which looks at uh, the development of multilingual content of our Cochrane summaries. And so we've had Spanish language content for a long time. We now have 12 languages in all. But French, con uh, French uh, content for, uh, starting around 2012. And what the red line shows there is the massive increase in monthly page views. So if you now look at the Cochrane Summaries site and the figures around that, and look at the countries of origin of people accessing that site, it's dominated by French and Spanish-speaking countries, people from French and Spanish-speaking countries, which I think shows that if you put information in, a, in, a, in the language that people use, people come and use it. So when we're trying to build impact, we're talking about getting the right reviews in the right hands, in the right form. And I just always, often tell this story about sort of an unusual way to get evidence into action. So Ian Roberts is uh, 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 the uh, lead editor for one of our groups uh, and, a, and a, a very renowned trialist. And he did the trial and the systematic review that looked at tranexamic acids use uh, in reducing uh, mortality in people who've had trauma. And so he took an unusual route to trying to get that into the public domain, which he went to somebody very near the head of the British Army. And he pointed out his evidence and said, actually, if you implement this evidence, you'll have a 20, 30% reduction in mortality of people who are injured on the battlefield. And that became the British Army policy, and that spread to their allies, and has now probably changed uh, practice across the world um, in the battlefield. It's a slightly unusual route, not, not very conventional, but uh, still very effective. It's about getting the evidence into the right hands. And similarly, this, uh, this, uh, stud this uh, review of the harms, uh, uh, relative harms of bevacizumab and ranibuzumab for uh, macular degeneration um, came at a time when we were going to Hyderabad in India for our colloquium. And the lead author, the excellent and fantastically gorgeous Lorenzo Milha, uh, was in uh, India and bumped into an information specialist who worked at uh, one of the big chain of eye hospitals in India. And that interaction became a YouTube video and changed the policy of prescribing in that hospital. Again, slightly unconventional. More conventional is the contribution Cochrane reviews to make to guidelines. And that probably is where we focus most of our effort. And you can see here uh, programs of reviews contributing to WHO guidelines, NICE guidelines, and 460-odd reviews uh, referenced and acknowledged in a Lancet midwifery series. I should talk about social media because it's becoming increasingly important in all our lives, as we know. And, uh, in particular, the altmetric scores. And this review just shows the sort of how people can build an altmetric score. And just for researchers in the audience, you know, managed to get an altmetric score of 1,055 is pretty darn good. And uh, one, one of the things that I think uh, contributed to that is that the researchers started to log 
where there was social media contact that weren't being caught by altmetrics and contacted altmetrics. So if you're thinking about uh, trying to improve your altmetrics score, you, you, you can monitor it yourself and, 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 and you can make, make it as high as it is going to go. Uh, we're also doing a lot of work at UKCC around uh, blogs and blog shots, and uh, Sarah Chapman at the UKC has done a number of really good pieces of work around making the re re results of Cochrane Reviews accessible to people. I just wanted to say something um, about press conferences, because um, I, I, we, we, were, we were talking a lot yesterday about press media releases, and I've been in the situation where I wanted to write a press release, I had, wanted to have a press release, and I've had the conversation with the press officer who says, well, we can write it the way you want it, and nobody will pick it up, because you're saying it's really uncertain, don't really know, blah, blah, blah. Or we can write it the way I'd write it, which is drug really works or drug really doesn't work, and everyone will pick it up. And you know, I can see that there's a tension there, and in the end you have to do the first thing, but you know, it's sometimes a battle. Whoop, how did that happen? So um, two, a couple of, about a couple of years ago, we started doing press conferences, particularly around reviews where we thought there was a real risk that people might um, get sort of sensationalist um, headlines out of reviews that we thought were quite nuanced. And I just wanted to say this in, in, in defense of, the, of journalists, because in each of the cases that we did this, I would have to say the reporting in the uh, media subsequently was really good. It was pretty close to what I'd have written if I'd been asked to, di to give dictation to the journalist. Um, and so it's made me think that actually it's a much better way of getting accurate reporting in media than using press releases and actually that the problem doesn't lie with the journalists, because actually, given the opportunity to, they did a darn good job. And actually, uh, the review authors loved it too. So all these comments were spontaneous. Um, and, uh, um, and people were pretty scared of going up in front of a journalist. I was quite scared because I thought they would say, hang on a minute, you've dragged us across London, and all you're telling us is we don't really know. Uh, but actually, nobody said that. They were actually seemed generally interested in the fact that we were expressing some uncertainty. What do we need to do better? We know we have to do, engage much better with decision makers. And we have so four categories of decision makers uh, that we're really keen on, the consumers and citizens, uh, practitioners, uh, policy makers, and researchers. And we need to engage much better with them both at the beginning of the process in terms of advocacy for evidence, in terms of working out where priorities lie, conducting the re reviews and some sort of knowledge translation activities uh, that, we, that, we, uh, that, that follow. So we need to do the right reviews, keeping pace with innovation, uh, new types, uh, and also we need a methodology, I think, about what's appropriate. So uh, Tom Jefferson's currently leading a uh, Cochrane-funded uh, piece of research looking about how you decide when it's worth or when you need to do a review that goes beyond published uh, reviews towards um, clinical study reports and so on. And also, I think we need to do what we can to fill the gap, because evidence doesn't make decisions, and there's a gap, and there's quite rightly a gap, between the evidence and the decision. But we can start to move things in the way, and this, uh, the, the decide, Grade and Decide project uh, which is, uh, I think, an EU-funded project over the last two years, I think has really helped us to understand where we might go with this. And so I'm probably about the 10th person to put a picture of an interactive summary of findings table, so you now will know immediately what it all is. But it, what it seems to me to be doing is, in, is inviting interaction, and uh, the, the reader is then able to uh, uh, put their, in a sense, add their preferences to the, to the picture. And also, the evidence decision frameworks, again, this is particularly angled at guideline people, trying to help them through the process of, of translating the evidence into something that might inform a guideline. So the, evidence, the need for evidence, as we've seen uh, from Catherine uh, and as seen elsewhere, is still very much present. It's getting more complex. It's, getting, it's changing. Uh, quality is still really important. But relevant and efficient uh, production is uh, very critical and certainly things that we uh, are working on uh, uh, at the moment and we know we need to improve. 
Uh, and, at the end, and, and I think the final part is the importance, I would say, of engaging with the end users and understanding their needs and preferences more effectively. Thanks.